Hello and welcome uh, to the World Cities panel on cultural equity. My name is Juan Davis, Chief Creative Officer of the Public Media Group of Southern California. For over a century, Los Angeles has been known as the entertainment capital of the world. While that may be its most widely known product pillar, it often overshadows other product pillars that add to the diverse experiences that our city has to offer. These include our culinary reputation, for example, outdoor activities and sporting events, as we enter into our decade of sports. And last, the depth of our arts and culture offering is magnificent. Most people, both locals and visitors, probably aren't aware that Los Angeles has more museums than New York City. There are over 115 museums in the City of Angels, and that number continues to grow month by month. But if we broaden the definition of culture to include the performing arts, public arts, street festivals, et cetera, the wealth of cultural offerings here in Los Angeles is even greater. Naturally, a rich cultural offering means that we also need to understand the cultural equity that our city provides to both Angelinos and to visitors. Today, we're gonna to spend some time speaking about cultural equity through the lens of diversity, accessibility, and inclusion. What does cultural equity truly mean? And more importantly, how do we ensure it? I am joined by four very well-respected panelists from the cultural community that are going to speak to us on this important topic. If I can have each one of you introduce yourselves to, uh, to this audience, that would be fantastic. My name is Jason Foster. I'm the president and COO of Destination Crenshaw. Destination Crenshaw is a private nonprofit building an open air art museum over 1.3 miles of Crenshaw Boulevard, celebrating the history, the presence and the future of black Los Angeles. Hi, I'm Leslie Ito, executive director of the Armory Center for the Arts in Pasadena. Hi, I'm Kristen Sakota, Director of the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture. Hi, I'm Danielle Brazel, and I'm the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs General Manager. I think we're going to have a great conversation. You're the right people to talk about equity in our city. But why don't we start with how can we talk about cultural equity during a global pandemic? and a global unveiling of the social and economic systematic inequities of our, of our society. Why don't we start with you, Jason? So when I think about, you know, the current state of culture, um, you know, because of the pandemic, you know, this, the one-to-one person-to-person interactions have been you know, dissipated, right, um, in, in our community. But what still exists are the cultural kind of commerce um, that happens online, right? Um, and even before the pandemic, the, the culture of Crenshaw, the culture of Los Angeles uh, was worldwide. It's a global industry uh, that we produce in the city of Los Angeles. And, you know, I think that even now more than ever, um, the culture that our communities create um, is accessible anywhere, anywhere, or anywhere, anytime by anyone. Kristen? Well, you know, I mean, in terms of how can we talk about cultural equity in the midst of this pandemic, I feel like actually one, we must. One of the things that we were chatting about when we were first starting the conversation is that there is no going back to how things were before. And this is for so many reasons, not only the civic uprisings and protests we've seen about really a country confronting uh, a history of racial inequity um, and communities that have been marginalized or even been um, you know, faced with violence and systemic violence, 
but also the pandemic itself and its impact on our communities and on our art sector really have revealed the systemic inequities, even in arts funding or which kinds of art forms are highlighted or are supported, how large organizations are budgeted and how those even track along racial lines, for example. And so I think absolutely this is the time, if ever there was one, to lean into notions of cultural equity. And for us at the LA County Department of Arts and Culture, we're thinking of cultural equity as values, policies, practices, anything that means everybody, and especially those who've been historically excluded, have access to arts and cultural resources, but also see their voices, their art forms valued and recognized and lifted up. Um, and so I think there's a lot of how that relates to a frame of not only this pandemic and the opportunity of disruption to create something new as we move forward with things that are sustainable, but also how that intersects with the notion of tourism and what is really an experience economy uh, in a lot of ways. Thank you, Chris. And, and yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. There is, you know, before the pandemic, we sort of, it, it, it was convenient to ignore certain things and say, well, that's sort of the way things are. Now it's almost impossible not to. Uh, face them and speak of them. Uh, Danielle, what, what is your perspective uh, in that, that relationship between what we're going through globally and here locally uh, and cultural equity? Thank you, Juan. It's so great to be here with my esteemed colleagues. I miss you all, um, but I know that we are deeply entrenched in um, the work of culture in our city, in our region, and really globally. Because when you come to Los Angeles, um, and everybody is welcomed in Los Angeles, um, there, there's a place where you will find home. Los Angeles is one of the most diverse global cities in the world. And um, uh, the, the effort and the commitment to cultural and racial equity has never been more, um, uh, more evident than it is today. And when we talk about cultural equity, I wanna just lift up something that Jason and Kristen said, that it is about the systems and the policies, but I also think it's about the systems of acknowledgement, the access to capital and the platforms that are needed. And cultural equity really needs to be done at scale in order to make sure that the creative expression is put up at the same level that we have in mass popular culture, in our cuisine, in our community-based work. Um, it needs to be kind of soup to nuts. And that I think is this real incredible opportunity where the uh, the, the veil, in a sense, the convenient light veil has been lifted and there has been a full-blown embrace because cultural equity actually benefits all of society. It actually helps support what we know is so powerful with the role that culture plays is that it is about an exchange. It is it about a learning. It is a value in and of itself. And when we value cultural um, representation that's reflective of our population, we all win. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, Leslie, um, what, what is your take on all these? And, and I want to encourage all of us to treat this as a conversation. We, we, we're all, we have all been in rooms together and we have talked about these, so I do encourage um, you know, you guys to just jump in and agree or disagree or add one thought to, to the other person so that we can build something a little more conversational and dynamic. Um, so I'm going to go back to you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, Leslie, uh, from, from your vantage point, how, how is this 
um, impacting your view on cultural equity? Um, well, I, I definitely agree with my colleagues in that this is an issue of, um, of uh, policy um, and that we need to make change on an institutional level. And I would add an extra layer to say that it is also on each one of us as Angelinos and on an individual basis to push out of our comfort zones, to listen and get to know each other better, um, whether that be your neighbor or the teacher that you're working with um, at a school or um, you know, our mail carrier, um, we need to push out of those of our own personal boundaries and, and really listen. I think that's one of the things that we're trying to do as we go on our cultural equity journey at the Armory. Um, you know, we used to develop um, products, arts education products, and to go out and sell them to school districts. Um, and now we're, we're creating programs with enough flexibility so that we can go out and talk to principals and listen to teachers' needs and meet them where they're at and meet their students where they're at. Um, so I think it's really about retraining ourselves to actively listen understand needs, um, develop relationships. And that really takes time, which also in, we're seeing is impacting scale. So we may not be able to reach as many people, but we're digging much deeper. Um, and I think that's really, for me, at the root of cultural equity. And if I can just add, to Leslie, something that you just said that is, I think is really important. The pivot and the transformation, all right, the change in your practice from selling products to school districts to kind of meeting teachers where they're at, I think is an inherent tension within the cultural community writ large. We, in the cultural space, are part of the creative economy, which is a multi-billion dollar industry. That is a global industry that basically tells the story of the world to itself. We are the story makers and the, um, the narrative makers. And very few people, um, you know, certain, certain sect of people have, have greater access to that side of the creative industry that create that side of the creative industry is very much rooted within a transactional frame and i think that what we're involved with in the cultural space and in the cultural equity space is transformation and so we operate in a very transactional narrative in many ways but our focus is is really generational and is really rooted within transforming um value of human expression. Let me rewind a little bit, Danielle, so that we, we, we give uh, folks that are, that are listening to this a little bit more of context. Um, uh, we're ultimately talking about, we're in a panel about cultural equity, but, uh, but tourism is, you know, at the, at the heart of, of who our audience is. You know, they, they're, they're looking at the impact that tourism is having right now, at the impact, at the positive impact that it, it has on cities and people across the world and here in Los Angeles. I think that one of the things that people do not understand um, is the, the, the culture and public dollars here in, in Los Angeles are very much connected to tourism. Am I right? Correct. Can you guys break that down for all of us for a second? I can take a stab at it. So Los Angeles, like many cities, have a hotel bed tax. And that hotel bed tax is routed both in terms of 1% for marketing and tourism promotion. And the other 1% is to support the nonprofit arts and cultural sector and the non-commercial cultural um, uh, uh, programs that the city uh, manages. Um, and so within that frame, that is um, uh, how the Department of Cultural Affairs receives its funding. It is the primary funding mechanism for the city to invest in the nonprofit cultural sector. 
is I would, uh, uh, yeah, Christine. Also, I was just going to also add one that we know that here in Los Angeles, so not only are there tourism dollars used to support public funding for the arts, but that in that ecosystem that we talked about, about arts and the creative economy being really part of one ecosystem. So when you're seeing an amazing, you know, major motion picture that actually relied on not only that major film studio, but hundreds of different artists, many of whom worked in nonprofit, small uh, independent producers or editing shops, uh, choreographers, theater writers who are now crossing over to TV. It's one ecosystem. And here in LA County, the size economically of that system is $200 billion of output every year and a staggering one out of every seven jobs in LA County is either part of the creative economy or it's generated indirectly. So the economy also in the arts and creativity then drives people to go to the restaurant next door, go to the shop down the street. And so it's actually all interconnected in multiple ways so that the more arts and culture is sustained, the better for the whole ecosystem um, of retail, tourism, and the creative sector, as well as the nonprofit. And when you and look at, sorry, Danielle, and when you look at, at, at couple of years ahead of us, we're going to have the Olympics, right? And, and you know, this is going to touch all of you, but there, there is a very clear understanding we need to invest because there's a lot of people that are going to be coming here in LA, to LA. Uh, we need to make sure that our metro system, our transportation is up to power and is going to be able to handle that our hotels, that our museums, and, and in a way that uh, I mean, I remember early meetings about uh, Destination Crenshaw. That was also part of the thinking. So there's also a lot of investment in uh, redevelopment that is going on that is happening because there's a thinking of, okay, well, we're, there's people that are going to be walking through the streets, so we need to do something, right? Yeah. Over, over 5 million people uh, a year. Uh, visiting Crenshaw Corridor and, and riding right down the center of it. And I think that, you know, our organization, uh, which kind of centers itself on Crenshaw Boulevard, is an unapologetically Black organization working with community members to really have access to the highest levels of privilege, which is infrastructure. Um, and thinking about how your city is created and how people interact with each other um, in a local ecosystem. Um, and, and how we can build a destination for our community that is shared with uh, visitors that come to and from Los Angeles. And, you know, I was just thinking about, like, how do you balance that, um, that transactionality or that transformation with the fact that the Black community is having their first shot in 50 years at solving systemic racism? Um, and really trying to look at it from that dynamic and really capture the level of energy um, that the arts and culture community has right now to really push for it. I mean, this is something that we could actually do. So it, we can't afford to sacrifice that opportunity, but we also have to create community that can be shared and that is welcoming uh, for everyone. So I think, you know, our project is really centered around arts and culture to really make sure that not only the community members, but everybody can walk with their heads up, um, can see each other, uh, but they can also celebrate Black art um, as being part of, uh, you know, our collective LA experience. Jason, you just touched on something so important for this conversation. As we're talking about cultural infrastructure, we're talking about things like public art, or building corridors, how transportation connects us to cultural experiences, to communities. I think tying that to cultural equity means asking who are we building it for? Who is going to benefit? Whose culture is going to be part of the expression so that there's real cultural exchange? Who's going to experience it? And also who's going to benefit from the jobs in tourism, in culture, in right? And who gets to lead on their culture and share it with the world? I mean, in, in a lot of ways, that at its heart is what cultural equity as relates to cultural infrastructure is all about. Kristen and Danielle, you both work for uh, the city and the county of LA, just making sure 
that we provide uh, arts and culture to our community, right? But both you, Jason and Leslie, you are uh, slightly off that um, line of work. Uh, but why, Jason, why don't you explain what Destination Crenshaw is and Leslie, the same thing with the Armory so that we can really get a picture of who is um, speaking in this panel. Thank you for that, Juan. Uh, Destination Crenshaw is a private nonprofit uh, building an open air art museum over 1.3 miles of Crenshaw Boulevard. Um, this unapologetically black project uh, will focus on putting a hundred uh, art, public arts commissions along Crenshaw Boulevard, uh, focus on workforce development for our local community and residents, as well as small business support for our black business owners throughout the corridor. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Leslie, how about the Armory Center? The Armory Center for the Arts is based in Pasadena, just at the edge of Old Town. And we have a exhibition space. Um, just before the pandemic um, set in, we had just opened the exhibition for Tanya Aguaniga. And um, it's a really great, um, we're really looking forward to this show, um, sharing immigrant stories and stories from the border. Um, and I think that that's really at the heart of um, where the rich fabric of Los Angeles's arts and culture comes together is really sharing those immigrant stories, whether your immigration story like mine started over a hundred years ago, or if that immigrant story belong, um, starts with you. Um, so the Armory has really, um, is looking to really emphasize those untold stories um, and share uh, the work of artists um, who tell those stories. Um, we have an upcoming show at the end of January. Um, Allison Sars um, sculptures will be in our space in collaboration with the new Benton Museum at Pomona College. And we've been pivoting to uh, do online classes. Um, so with our community partners, um, studio classes, and uh, we just finished a uh, democracy zine class with teens and a collaboration with California Calls, a statewide advocacy organization. So, you know, where our work is, um, we're trying to be relevant both in terms of how we deliver our content, um, but also really um, leaning into our work around cultural equity and, um, and empowering communities to tell their stories. Thank you, Leslie. It is so good to have you all here. Um, Danielle uh, and Kristin, you both work in the public sector with, uh, as part of government entities. Uh, I would love for you to share what your role is um, with the audience that we have. Sure, happy to, Juan. So my role is on behalf of the County of Los Angeles. So it's essentially the whole wide region of Los Angeles that's more than 10 million people and comprised of 88 different municipalities, including our shining star Los Angeles City uh, and many unincorporated areas as well to ensure that there is arts and culture supported for everyone as part of quality of life. And we do that in so many ways, grant making, so grants to organizations like the Armory or others you may have been to uh, here in Los Angeles but also supporting arts education and commissioning public art as well. So when you see art all around, that could be work that our department commissioned or that others in the public sector commissioned. We also work in the realm of policy uh, and research to really move arts and culture forward for the benefit of all. And I think it's important, you know, from an international lens to understand that the United States has a really interesting landscape in this regard. Unfortunately, compared to many of our countries and colleagues around the world, our level of investment from the public sector is not nearly as high as what we might see in some other places. But it is an interesting model 
where the public side, for example, we own the LACMA or the Music Center or the Hollywood Bowl, um, and we have grants to hundreds of arts organizations all over the county, but we also rely on their earned in income, so tickets or admissions, and we rely heavily on philanthropy from private donors. And that's really the, the US model that we have to ensure that there's arts and culture uh, uh, all over the county, institutions, venues, but also street festivals, uh, activities in public art. Exactly. And the city of Los Angeles is one of those 88 cities. We are a population of a little over 4 million people. We're an independent city. So Kristen and I collaborate, but we're in a sense department heads with our own agencies. Um, but given that we are both committed to fostering a healthy ecology for arts, culture, and creativity in our region, we work very, very closely through an interagency lens. We also have colleagues in Long Beach and Santa Monica and Culver City, all are independent cities. And like Kristen, we manage a grants portfolio, uh, we uh, manage uh, the public art and the city art collection uh, and we run community art centers so think of watts towers and watts towers art center think of frank lloyd wright's hollyhock house which is the first unesco designated site in all of los angeles um, those are under the city of los angeles department of cultural affairs as well as uh, the municipal art gallery and about 30 other cultural facilities and historic monuments um, so so the portfolios are big and unwieldy and our public support for the department of cultural affairs is squarely reliant on tot which is transient and occupancy tax the hotel bed tax um, that that um is is fueled by tourism okay so uh, we just talked about the reliance of arts and culture on tourism in many different aspects, many different levels, right? There's direct tax that comes from usage. There's, um, there's the consumption part of it, the, 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 um, the labor part of it. Um, how hard have we been hit here in the city of LA? Uh, because tourism is virtually you know, disappeared. Uh, I'll take that. Um, like many global cities across the world, pre-pandemic, um, we were looking at over-tourism. And as a matter of fact, I was, um, last year I was in Venice um, with OECD um, talking about over-tourism with Venice and, in, um, and how cities and uh, local governments were trying to mitigate the catastrophic impact that tourism was having on local communities. A lot of that was being fueled by Airbnb, um, uh, day tourists, etc. And it was a really complicated problem. And overnight, we saw a 90% drop in tourism and hotel occupancy in Los Angeles. That has put a catastrophic um, uh, effect on the city re city's revenue on a general frame, much less the commitment to fund culture um, writ large. And so I think that this is a very important moment for the city of Los Angeles to grapple with, because on one hand, the mayor Mayor Garcetti uh, has demonstrated his commitment to racial equity in city government by issuing an executive directive um, actually on June 19th, which was in celebration of Juneteenth um, uh, around racial equity in city government. And at the same time, a complete defunding of uh, the revenue stream that supports the advancement of cultural equity within the city of Los Angeles. So we are definitely grappling with how to maintain the work in light of the current catastrophic financial impact as a result of COVID-19. How, how do you, the, 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 the three of you, um, how, how have you noticed the impact that tourism or the lack of is having in the arts and culture sector? 
How about you, Leslie, at the Armory? Um, I, I, I definitely think it's going to impact us. I mean, past the city of Pasadena, as everyone knows, um, January 1st is a big day um, and that's going to be drastically changed this year. So I think definitely um, is going to impact us. It's and you mean January fun. 1st because of the Rose, the Rose Parade, the yeah. Rose, the game and the yeah. parade. Um, I, I guess this is the optimist in me. I also think that this crisis is also seeding. I would like to think it's also seeding future tourism, though, so that when it is safe to travel, um, you know, for instance, our classes, our art classes online, um, because they're online, we're attracting people outside of our normal scope. And my hope is that the people that were taking classes from Atlanta and Virginia, when they come to Los Angeles, they will come visit us now. Um, so, you know, I think that there is some silver lining here um, and there is, there's been an opportunity for us to really, um, to um, a greater access to more people. And, and with that said, um, you know, I'm also very concerned on the cultural equity side about the growing digital divide and how that impacts um, the communities that we're also trying to serve. You know, each one, uh, each one of us has a different definition of what Los Angeles is, right? And, but like I was saying before, you know, LA has sold an idea of itself to the world. And in somehow, somewhere, it also sold an idea of itself to itself. And do you all think that this is an opportunity for us to rethink how we invest in tourism, to be able to bring a cultural equity lens, not only in investment, but in representation? <laughs> Absolutely. And I would say this, that I was really think that visitors and convention, Los Angeles visitors and convention uh, bureau have done a great job at kind of shifting their tourism narrative um, to something that feels a little bit more like an inside LA experience. So I really want to kind of lift that up. But I also think that there's a really important framework that we need to learn how to do is one, how do we become better hosts? And how do our guests learn how to come into our house? And that's something that I don't think we, um, I, I think it's an area that we can grow in. Even in our, our, our little tour around the city that we all shared, in many ways what's so exciting is that every one of those points is now accessible through public transportation on a metro line. You can get from Hollywood and Barnesdall Art Park to the Armory, down to Little Tokyo, down to Destination Crenshaw, and then head over to the beach. So I think that that's one of the most exciting things that's gonna happen. And now for us as a welcoming committee is how do we truly make these spaces really accessible and welcoming for our, for our guests? And building on what Danielle was saying, I think it's also really incumbent upon us and what you were sharing, Juan, about the stories we've told about ourselves. So we know that right now, because of COVID, a lot of the focus will be local. People are going to want to stay local. They're going to want to explore, explore what's in their community. They're going to want to explore what's around LA. Then it might start to expand to more broadly, what's a day trip away, what's California, what's international. We'll build back in a few years. So let's take this time to not only put forward, uh, you know, some of the big attractions or the known names or the Western European traditions that are often kind of billed as uh, kind of normative, uh, um, really, let's think about cultural equity so that we're putting forward um, going to, of course, amazing places that you might go to the Getty or, um, you know, a large institution, but also let's highlight those other gems that folks don't know because everyone deserves to experience the stories and cultures of others and everyone deserves to have their culture and artistic forms and stories told. From our research, we're seeing right now because we're doing an audience outlook study with Wolf Brown, that audiences are eager to come back, but they are really concerned about safety 
And it's going to be some time before many of them are ready to really go indoors to uh, try things that are beyond their community or to make plans that would require travel. But let's use this as an opportunity to, to show more things and have that be just part of how we do it. We push these other opportunities that may be right in our backyard. I think it's ex I think it's exciting. Also, um, we have I think seven years uh, to figure out how to tell this story um, before the Olympics comes, and um, and I think that's going to be a pivotal moment for us. Yes, I was going to bring up the the Olympics again because I think that that is a confluence of so many different things, right? Um, you know, and I think that Destination Crenshaw, as I mentioned before, is a, is a, it's a great model of what this could look like um, in terms of public investment, thinking of tourism, but also thinking of the infrastructure of the people that live there, the arts and culture, the, the, the sense of self-reflection that you need to see in place. Um, I, I want to have a little bit of an open conversation um, in terms of is this destination Crenshaw a model uh, that we can all start to emulate that comes from a lot of very different places? I believe the destination Crenshaw is a model, uh, not only for the community led uh, development that can that can really revitalize a community, but also create a space where it's welcoming not only for the residents that exist, uh, but also the people that come and visit them. Um, over four years ago, uh, community members came together and they wanted to actually create a response um, that really celebrates the history, um, acknowledges the people that live here, but also the dreams. Like, what do we hope for? What do we aspire for um, as, as people of South Los Angeles? And I believe that's something that they can be proud of uh, when the Olympics come uh, in 2028. One of the things we haven't actually said out loud is that our diversity here in Los Angeles is one of our greatest assets. Mm -hmm. We are one of the most diverse counties in the nation. And when we talk about, you know, those demographics in the United States, people are looking to the year 2040 as being potentially the year that the country becomes majority minority. Well, we've been in that living that for decades. Um, and in fact, right now we're really tipping into a place where we're um, about 50% Latino uh, identified population. So that level of diversity and having that reflected in our infrastructure, in our art, in our monuments, in our places where you go and in the things that you would be able to share with visitors is really, I think, an important component. And as we build towards the Olympics and we're, you know, as Danielle has said, welcoming the world, we have so much of that diversity already here, but it's about ensuring that we're really investing in how we share it. So just furthering the conversation, two points about, um, about this type of investment in projects like Destination Crenshaw. Um, how do we make sure that um, the word, the big G, gentrification and tokenism are not part of this? Because I totally agree with you, uh, Kristen. We, that's one of our biggest assets, but it's often used as a marketing ploy rather than a genuine bottom up um, uh, you know, build up of our communities. And the arts are also often used as a precursor to displacement and gentrification. I think it didn't begin intentionally. I think it was really organic that in places like San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, the arts district, what have you, artists often will um, really make a life and make things amazing and also make things cool. Um, and that can actually spur gentrification if predatory development comes in after. Um, and so it means some of our communities are triggered by that if they see galleries or art activities coming in. And it is hugely important that we try to put in place strategies of ownership, um, strategies of permanency that really uh, put the community and those, uh, especially communities of color, 
in the driver's seat and really benefiting from what we're doing and leading the way uh, to, to try to avoid that. There's a great example um, of, of how a community in Little Tokyo um, kind of created a self-determination effort that helped to stave off that. And I know Leslie was and still possibly deeply involved in that. And maybe that's a really good case study to surface in this conversation. Yes, yeah, Sustainable Little Tokyo um, was, is, I should say, a um, sort of a three or four prong approach to economic, um, artistic, um, and historical preservation of the neighborhood. Um, and really looking at um, helping the small businesses survive, the arts and cultural institutions and artists. Um, and it was, it's at the heart of it, it is about self-determination. And um, I'm so excited to see another um, model of that in our city with Destination Crenshaw. I think uh, the two of them have a lot in common and it was to hold hold the gentrification and the impact that Metro could have had on our communities. Um, and I think we've been really successful at, um, at, at being a model for how to empower communities um, and, and also to put artists at the heart of that work, which I think is incredibly important and very um, indicative of the strength of Los Angeles. If you all don't mind, Danielle, I would like to get a little more, uh, you know, pragmatic about what is it that we need to do to ensure that the efforts like in, in Little Tokyo and in Destination Crenshaw will become our way of moving forward and not uh, the opposite. I mean, what, what, what do you, from your own vantage point, need to do to push policy, to make sure that this type of equity is the one that we are going to see for ourselves and the tourists, when they come here to LA, are going to see for, uh, from our city. I think, and thank you for asking that question, Juan. I think that at the heart of both of these extraordinary case studies is community resiliency and self-determination that resiliency and self-determination will hold public officials accountable to ensuring that um, large-scale infrastructure um, that is being brought into communities, which is important for the long-term sustainability of our city, um, is, is being done in a way that is community-led and is community appropriate. I also wanna point out that when, when community development begins to occur in this way that the ecology is set into place. So for example, the public art, percent for public art programs that are triggered both from the infrastructure projects from Metro and the subsequent infrastructure projects that will occur either through private or public development have an engaged citizenry that will keep those efforts focused and, um, and done in a way that is appropriate to the community. And I think that that's a really essential component because if there is not development, then public art dollars aren't driven into a community. So it becomes kind of a hand in glove kind of thing. I would also say that in, in the United States, land use and property owners and property owner rights seem to be power. That is where people hold their economic power. That is how police um, is, is, is dispatched and prioritized. Um, and so I think when you have community ownership, that is, that is the equity that we're talking about that is needed to maintain healthy ecology for all of the citizens. How about the, the rest of you? Well, just to pick up on what Danielle was saying, I think when we talk about ownership, I, I think we need to make sure we're talking about both literal ownership, 
that community members uh, who can, you know, own their homes, that businesses can stay in their businesses and that artists and arts nonprofits have creative workspace that they can be in so that they won't be displaced by fast rising rents if their neighborhood becomes more popular or a train comes in. But we're also talking about the role that arts and culture can play in really increasing a sense of ownership. Um, we found that with public art and other kinds of processes that if arts and culture is part of that community engagement and that community led activity. And if arts and culture is on the agenda as well, when you're building or when somebody, uh, a municipality or a hotel developer or anybody is doing a project that can actually increase the sense of community ownership, community pride of place, um, and really making a civic space where civic narratives can take place there, not just um, kind of traditional uh, Western ideas of capitalist ownership, private ownership, that then trumps um, the idea of a communal space where everyone can take part in ownership. And, and with that, I think we really do need to make sure that artists and arts organizations and small businesses have the ability to own and gain access to capital in this country. It is really essential because that is how you build the equity that is needed in order to leverage resources um, appropriately. And, and just to add to that, you know, I couldn't agree more. You know, over the last six months, Destination Crenshaw has really um, did two things. We really focused on our small businesses along the Crenshaw Corridor to help them, not only through this process, through public funds and being able to keep their doors open, but also understand their true valuation uh, mm -hmm. as land to really be able to have a subsequent conversation with any speculative real estate that comes in to know their worth. Because yes. I think that it is their extrinsic value, but it's also their intrinsic value That's and what right. they mean to the community. And the, second right. thing, and the second thing is we're, we're focused on right now creating a framework for what we're calling the Creative Economy Council. Mm. Um, and this is a way that we can actually focus our artists, our entrepreneurs, our creatives, our designers, and really bring them together to figure out how we are going to actually capture the economic benefit that's created by this project. So not only creating it through impact and really making it go outside of the community, but creating a business ecosystem that we can actually start seeing the exchange of ideas become products and then become things that our visitors can actually participate in, right? Uh, because that's what's actually gonna make this community fulfilled uh, through everybody riding up and down the Metro. Yes, and those community benefits, that's not about charity. And hopefully it's not just viewed as a transactional negotiation someone has to kind of just get through. We will only all be able to have prosperity if we're all sharing in the prosperity. Um, and I think that's such a huge driver and that there's parity for communities that have had disinvestment before now. We're trying to put forward um, and the Board of Supervisors uh, has on their docket uh, a public art and private development ordinance for unincorporated areas of the county, because there are other cities that already have public art as part of private development projects. But we wanna make sure that uh, our, our unincorporated areas get the same and that it's community led, like Danielle was saying. And, and if I could just add one more thing, the reason why Los Angeles is great is because an organization like Destination Crenshaw is both supported by the county of Los Angeles and the city of Los Angeles. So it is the public investment that even allow us to be able to even move these ideas forward. And I think that that's the difference between Los Angeles and other cities, right? Like we, we support our own. And I was just gonna tie the whole conversation together by, by just reiterating what we started with in the conversation, which is we need the institutional policy support but we also need that grassroots people on the ground, um, residents, young people, um, our elders in the community, all of those voices need to be at the table for any of this to work. 2028, we're gonna have the Olympics. That's 
little less than eight years from now, what LA do you want people to um, experience when they come here and uh, share when others come? I want to say that I want the um, I want a Los Angeles that truly does take care of our own, and that means that the people who do not have a place to call home have a place to call home, and that they are cared for, and that they are part of our cultural um, capital, because everyone in Los Angeles matters. And everyone has a story to be told and to be heard. And I really think that, um, that we need to look at our city holistically. And we can't do that if we have 30,000 people or 60,000 people or however many people um, without homes. Kristen. Um, I would say I want it to be a Los Angeles that is even beyond embracing its diversity. I want us to be a place that through our words, our actions, our art is actually moving towards a lens of equity, justice, freedom, anti-racism. And so at its heart, I think that goes to inclusion and a sense of belonging. Um, and, and the arts really can play a huge role where we have everything from things that are super grassroots to uh, prominent artists to movements that began here to, of course, uh, globally known destinations. And so wrapping that all up, you can belong and you can explore here, but to everyone's benefit so that it's shared prosperity. Jason. Uh, well, first, I hope that they come and see a Destination Crenshaw that is thriving. Um, you know, people participating in and along the space and, and really able to experience the Open Air Art Museum as it's intended. Um, and, and second, I hope that other communities use the model. Um, and we really have an opportunity to have some of these cultural um, you know, basins, you know, lifted up in the city of Los Angeles because Crenshaw is only one community of thousands um, and each of them have artists, musicians, uh, families, restaurants, um, all hidden gems. Um, and I, I would love to see all of them kind of be able to celebrate um, their cultural worth uh, for, for everybody to see. Well, I think that the beauty of um, for visitors to Los Angeles is that you can always find a slice of comfort, a slice of yourself in LA. But beyond that comfort zone, there is a world of discovery. Um, the rich cultural fabric of Los Angeles is, is right there. If you can just take that small leap out of your comfort zone. Well, thank you, Kristen Sakota, Danielle Brussel, Leslie Ito, and Jason Foster. This was um, a really fantastic way of spending the afternoon. Uh, I hope that the audience uh, that tuned in had as much fun as I did listening to your insights. And hopefully they all understand that we're all in this together, as you all said. Uh, equity is about we. It's not about you, it's not about me. Uh, and that's the LA that we want to build for the future. Thank you so much. <laughs>